opportunity for me to continue that hard work that I, I've been doing through service and make a difference uh, that I used to do as a parent where I would actually reach out to board members, teachers, and other people about little things that were um, not working in our schools. Uh, like when they were going to drop honors biology uh, for my daughter when she was gonna go into her freshman year and we were looking at leaving the district and they were able to make sure it stayed on so that we could stay in the school district. From fighting against the $15,000 that our, our parents on the swim team used to get charged. And so there was a lot of stuff that I did as a parent because I was involved because thankfully I was able to work from home and work in the, a, a career in a world where I could, I could take the time to, uh, to get to people who needed to be uh, spoken to about keeping programs. And so by joining the school board, I bring that perspective of a parent who's been through that, whereas so many parents who are working far away as far as Irvine, on the west side, El Segundo, they can't make it. But I've been there, and I have, am somebody who can bring that same experience so that your children don't have to go through the fights that I had to go through for my children. My wife's a teacher. She teaches continuation high school in Long Beach. Uh, the stories that come home with her are stories that in this community would probably raise some eyebrows and drop some tears. Um, so I've, I've heard so many things about what it means to be a teacher from her perspective and that love and the size of the heart that it takes to go into a classroom every day and sit with our ch children on their good days and their bad days. And so from that perspective, as the husband of a teacher, from the perspective of a father who has been in this community, highly involved, hyper-involved, more than most parents, um, and as somebody who, who just cares, who's put a lot in via service, um, I think this role on the school board is a natural evolution of what I've been doing for the community, and I think I can help a lot of families out by taking those steps to help us. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you to the Chamber for putting this together for us this evening. Uh, my name is Becky Langenwalter. So I've lived in La Mirada since 1985, and before that, my husband actually grew up here. Um, I'm the proud parent of five Norwalk La Mirada graduates and who all have gone on to finish college and uh, are mar happen to be married. Several of them have started families. I'm the grandparent of two current students. And um, our kids were in band, soccer, welding, ASB, theater, flag football, to name a few. So, um, uh, you know, La Mirada has, um, the, the school district is uh, an, an, an integral part of our family. Uh, I care passionately for kids and families because growing up is hard and especially hard in these days. That's why I volunteered in classrooms. I was on school site council at La Puma. I helped uh, families at Biola for 23 years to set up financial aid to attend there or somewhere else. And now I help individuals and families uh, as a marriage and family therapist uh, to get, their, get back on track when things go wrong. Um, let's see, why am I the right person for this job? Our board needs fresh ideas and direction. I am an independent voice for teachers and parents. We need some course corrections and that requires compassion and boldness from someone who understands the community and the community values. My professional training is in mental health, higher education, and business. And those are all relevant to the role of a school board member. Mental health services are in our schools now. What to do with at-risk kids is um, a very important question that educators are facing. Mental health services themselves are not without risk. You um, have to be careful how you apply them. So La Mirada, Norwalk, let's get this right. Um, whenever we can, I, we, I believe we need to coordinate with parents. As a business owner, several times over, I'm familiar with managing budgets, pursuing grants, and providing scholarships, and will do it with a priority on classroom learning. My commitment to our schools is um, more so now that I'm partially retired. 
That's why I have attended and spoken at school board meetings for the last three years. I met with Superintendent Lopez, teachers, and district admins on many occasions, and um, am running for this position for a second time. I also ran in 2022. So it is an honor to do this, to do this, to attempt to be of service to our district, and together I believe we can make a difference. So I ask for your support. Thank you. Mr. Constantine, what do you feel is the most important job as a school board member? Well, the school board member is the checks and balances to our superintendent, uh, to our administration, is the people who are bringing the community into the administration to make sure that the, the parents and uh, the greater community are represented properly. The values of the community, uh, the, the values of, um, of the families, uh, especially uh, the changing values that are happening uh, throughout the community to make sure that everybody's included. Um, we're responsible to ensure that all the, all the kids don't, um, don't fall behind, that everybody is equally represented, and at the same time, uh, making sure that our teachers in the plans that are being put together by administration are being properly uh, taken care of to make sure that their classrooms have the tools necessary uh, to make sure that for all the extracurricular programs that they're properly funded. And to make sure that the vision of our district is one that is helping us keep students and uh, bring value to our families. So that means making sure that our kids aren't leaving to neighboring districts because they're offering programs like STEM or they're offering other uh, VAPA programs at the high school level. We need to make sure that we're doing and investing in our schools and so as a school board member, we need to be the people who are making sure that those things are taken care of and that the people on the outside, the noise, the other folks who are trying to come in and, and bring other uh, ideas uh, that don't necessarily work for our district, stay out. We need to make sure that the budget is moving forward, that we're utilizing the dollars that we have. We need to make sure that our, our plan and the superintendent's plan are in line so that we invest properly in each and every classroom, in each and every program. And so I, uh, uh, I see the school board as, as the, the core representation of our community um, of, and through knowing parents, through being involved in service groups, uh, we can bring that information uh, to the administration. Because let's face it, we're being elected to represent people who are working all the time who are taking care of their children who don't have the time to do this. We are their voice, and so we have to, uh, we have to be their voice. We also sometimes have to be a very difficult voice, and so with that, it comes with a lot of tough decisions. It also comes with a lot of times where we're not always gonna be the favorite person in the room, but over time, as the plans come through, uh, things do work out. So I do know that it's not gonna be all wine and roses, uh, but I do know that it's, uh, it's probably uh, the most important job because when you're taking care of the children of the community, you're also taking care of the families. You're taking care of the grandparents who are responsible for getting them to and from school in a lot of families. You're responsible for making sure that their vision of who they're gonna grow up to be is accomplished. And so that means offering the programs of, you know, when the little kid draws a spaceman on a piece of paper and says, I want to be an astronaut. Are you going to offer the science classes and everything possible so that when they come out of this school, if they're going to stay wanting to be an astronaut, that they can go off into the Naval Academy, that we have the other opportunities that surround that so that they can, they can make great leaps in their life. Thank Otherwise, you, we're, you know, we're, we're just sitting here occupying a chair and we can just let AI run it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lenya Walters, same question. What is the most important job as a school board member? Yes, yeah, so the, the primary responsibility of the board is to hold the superintendent responsible, accountable. So that means that um, he has an entire uh, administration beneath him and a lot of teachers as well. So it's, it's more than just him personally. We, we are his boss. Uh, the board also selects a superintendent if there's a vacancy there and um, so even depending on what the administrative team is, is bringing forward that is something that the school board has a lot of can have input on um, it, are they going in a direction that the community feels is um, wanted um, 
A board member also is responsible for hearing from parents and our constituents, if you will. So attending celebrations, taking a lot of photographs, um, you know, celebrating grand openings, um, and being being out there in the community so you can hear from our em employees, our certificated and our classified, to hear what's going well and what isn't. And um, finally, the third point on that, I would say the financial health of the district. So we vote. Uh, the board votes on budgetary, um, the budgets, um, and what, the way things are allocated, and if these expenses are justified or if we can do them better in-house, as opposed to hiring teacher training outside, um, and the source of that. Um, so I'd say those are three three main um, roles. Thank you very much. The next question, Mr. Constantine. What will you do to ensure that the arts and the AB schedule is maintained at Vinton? So, yeah, and this was great because when they started the Benton program, a number of us parents actually, we were, uh, many of us were already set to go to Los Coyotes and we chose Benton, uh, not just because it started off with a great principal um, who had great vision and was a great leader when we had her at La Pluma, but when we got to Benton, uh, the, the way they sold us on the arts, the way they sold us on what the, the vision was of how it was going to be, uh, we were all in. And when... Uh, when they began the discussions of starting to pull back funding or rechange the funding, a number of us showed up down at, uh, at the school district office and protested to make sure that it continued to be properly funded. Whether it was part of a phased approach or whatever, what we wanted to do is make sure that it's properly funded. As somebody whose daughter was who went to Benton and now is building a career off of that experience in film, she just graduated from Cal State Long Beach with her degree in film, she actually has a film right now on the on the on the uh, circuit for um, film festivals. It just got selected as a as a nomination for the Newport Beach uh, Film Festival for a finalist there. So so and it all came from Benton. And without that funding, that dream doesn't happen. Without those teachers, that doesn't happen. And so you have to ensure that the arts are funded above all else. So many other places are removing them. It's removing the imagination and the dreams and the hopes that a lot of kids have. And when you remove those dreams, you've basically made our, our, uh, our schools an empty void, a gray place where nothing can happen. What decorates your refrigerator when the kids are little? It's art. What decorates the, the, the sounds in your home when the kids are singing? That's art. When you go to performances, that first recorder concert when they're in the elementary school, that's art. Some of these kids go on and they will continue art in band, in VAPA programs in high school, wherever it may be. But we have to invest in the arts. We need a VAPA program. We are losing kids to Fullerton right now because they have a better VAPA program. We need to invest in VAPA or we're going to continue to lose kids to neighboring districts. Thank you. Ms. Langham-Walton, mm -hmm. do you need me to repeat the question, please? Uh, what will you do to ensure that the arts and the AB schedule is maintained at Benton? Yeah, so um, there's Proposition 28 that was passed actually that provides funding for the arts. It's very important as a district for us to <clears throat> maximize the funds from that. Um, I completely agree with David that um, arts, music, performing arts, film, photography are such um, important electives because they do become careers for some kids. And this is, um, you know, some of us have a more a brain that works on more on the artistic side. Some of us have a brain that works more on the manual side or the, the language side. But um, art is a very important area for emotional expression. And um, it's, it's, there are some people that you, you won't catch if you don't catch that part. Um, I, I'm also aware that VAPA and um, it's not an art program, but ACE at La Mirada High School, there are grant funds for those programs. One third of those funds come from the state of California. So we need to continue to be in compliance with our VAPA program and, uh, and anything else that, that is partially funded that way. So the state provides one third, the district provides a third, and then I believe the school site does as well. So those are a couple sources. Um, and then my final comment about that is we have some total gems here that in, in the last three years I've really learned about some things I didn't even know about in the way of programs. And we really need to market these, um, market these programs better than we, we do now through the school website, um, just 
broadly, so people that are even outside of our district that need a program like that, that is really excelling. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, number uh, so, question, um, with declining enrollment and the expiration of federal COVID relief funds, many California schools are facing financial challenges. California is also facing a state budget deficit that could affect some more districts than ours. Uh, Normark NLMUSD is losing 400 students per year. Is there a solution? I don't know if everybody remembers, what was it, the late 90s when Pete Wilson said you're going to have an 18 to 1 ratio or else, and he didn't provide the framework, he just said do it. And that's sort of what we have to do. We've got us, we currently uh, have been offering, operating at a very good, generous surplus every so often in this district. And even though we're losing COVID funds, there are ways, uh, we have several board members today who are excelled at providing and finding grants to continue to fund programs very well. We need to continue to be creative in finding the funds. We also need to make sure that we're maximizing the dollars we're providing. I understand the need for a rainy day fund, but at a certain point, some of the surpluses we've operated under are almost criminal to what we're doing in the classrooms. We're not providing enough tools to our teachers. We're not providing all the resources possible to make all the dreams that they want to have come true for these kids in the classroom. We have to, we have to use the money we've got. And if they, it, now we can talk all we want about the per student funding model and how some things need to change and how it, it doesn't balance out. And especially as districts move and population shift while we have new schools being built in places like Hemet and other schools are shutting down in downtown LA and other parts of our community. As the demographics are changing, the one thing that still doesn't change is that the investment in students still needs to go up. It needs to be a priority at the state level. If it's not going to be a priority at the state level, the state won't have a problem because everybody's going to leave because they're going to want to go to another state. They're going to go to Virginia. They're going to go to North Carolina. They're going to find some other place where they can take their job. Because now in the world, like my business, my headquarters are in Virginia. I get to work from my home. Living here is a bit of a luxury. but I just as well can take my job, just as many other parents in our community can take their job to another place if they believe that the investment in the students are better, if they think their children are going to have a better future. So at the state level, they do need to change the way we fund schools. They do need to provide more. But we at a district need to stop holding on to so much extra rainy day fund, and sometimes you just got to spend the money and put it where it belongs. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Shall I repeat the question for you? Uh, no. I, okay. Great. So you, you're probably all familiar with the demographic um, trend that we're on right now, where there are fewer uh, high school graduates right now. They refer to it as the cliff, and um, and but we're not really talking about that when we're talking about the enrollment decline that Norwalk La Mirada is experiencing. I mean, everybody's going through that demographic shift. What we're talking about is our students leaving our district and going to a neighboring district. So that is that is a major problem. Um, we're, we're on the verge of a crisis, actually, an enrollment crisis. And it's very important that we get this turned around. Um, my approach would be to uh, immediately uh, work with the board to get them to agree to an analysis, a data-driven analysis of the last five years of every transfer of district transfer request we received and um, find out what are the reasons that are being given. We know anecdotally some of the reasons. Some, some families have childcare in Whittier, so, uh, or maybe mom teaches there, or something like that. So there's not too much we can do about those out of district transfers. But we do know that we lose students because of programs that are offered in neighboring districts. So that is something we, we can do something about. We also know that um, behavioral issues on campuses can sometimes leave such a bad taste in a family's um, mouth that they, they transfer out. And um, a third area is parent dissatisfaction. So I've, I've heard from a lot of parents over the last three years, and there are reasons that parents um, do get unhappy with the things that we do, maybe how quickly a, a behavioral issue was addressed or something like that. So the reason I bring that up is because that is something we can actually do something about. I met with uh, Superintendent Lopez several times over the last few years, and um, there was a book that was objected to by parents, and, um, and we brought that book um, 
uh, to him and reviewed it with him, and uh, he took it took it out of the curriculum immediately. It was a required textbook. I'm sorry, it's not supposed to do that. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop. We'll edit it out. <laughs> yes, we will. We will. Dismiss it. Okay. Uh, we have a question from our audience. Um, would you support selling school property to the city of La Mirada for youth sports fields? So, the um, I, I, first and foremost, I think the, the best use of of the properties in a uh, transfer uh, agreement is a way to find out how we can get some sort of 99-year lease off of them, which is a very common thing uh, that's happening in areas where they need to add uh, any form of development uh, so that we have a, a routine uh, income coming in off of it. Uh, selling it at today's market value, um, and especially, as we all say, if I had bought a house back in 1990-whatever and held onto it today, it would be amazing, you know, we would, we would be rolling in dough. And so many people who are actually leaving the state are doing that right now because they bought a home in the 70s. Same thing, same uh, principle applies to property when it comes to uh, unused land. Now, uh, selling it to a, another or uh, another school district or a private school, I don't believe that that's a solution because that creates competition within our own backyard. And I don't need to see competition as another place where our students are going to leave to. What I want to see is, is a plan where either working with the cities, if some of it becomes parkland, or if some of it becomes developed, or if some of it stays in a way where it becomes a Y or other facility like that. But I don't want to sell it to another private school. There's a lot of these large, major private school organizations that are going out and getting involved in communities, and I don't want to have competition in my own backyard. I need to have those guys stay in other cities so that we don't have to focus not just on losing our students to the people who are across the street, but um, we can only we only focus on losing our students to the people who are next door. Because once you start adding in extra competition, it creates a lot of stress on how in the world am I going to retain students. Like we were saying, 50% of the high school students in this city alone leave to neighboring districts. And that is a massive budgetary drain on the system. And if you can hold on to those students by offering STEM programs or do something creative like they've done in Long Beach, they've added special culinary academies and business academies. So there's a lot we can do. So we can sell it or we can lease it, but I don't want to really sell it right away because that's that's a one-time deal. Sorry about going over. That's great. Thank you. Just like Walter? Um, yes, I, uh, as a California person, I understand too the, the risk you're taking when you sell property. Um, and, and in 30 years, we'll need it again. It will be needed um, if you follow the demographic projections. I, I know we are in need of sporting um, fields and facilities, and I would like to work with the city government and see how we could have a partnership to um, have more fields for our, our athletes. And um, I would be more inclined to, to uh, do a rental or a lease agreement I know we have Bethany's house. It's a uh, preschool program for special needs children, and it, they actually help get these children ready to come into our district. And they, you know, I know recently they've had to relocate uh, because I don't know something was going to change at this campus. They were all worried they were going to lose their lease. So we have organizations like that that actually feed into our district, and um, you know we really need to manage our tenants well because that is an income stream for us. And we can find, um, I believe we would be able to find tenants that, that actually complement what we're doing. Thank you. Um, we will start this next question with Ms. Lincoln Walter. Um, in the past few years, there have been statements made and actions taken to reduce the involvement of parents in their children's education with some school districts, uh, even calling parents potential terrorists. How will you be proactive in protecting the rights of parents and their children? Um, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, so someone mentioned earlier in the conversation before we started our formal, formal discussion that um, a lot of parents don't get involved. And, you know, one of the things that I find unfortunate is that when parents do come, if we, if we don't 
if we don't listen to them and incorporate them, I think they get discouraged. And then, then they feel like, well, what's the point when I do try to give input? Um, I'm not always heard. And I think that's where some of the uh, very emotional, uh, the emotion has come out in school board meetings where it's kind of been um, a result of some actions. So um, uh, what will I do? Well, for one thing, um, I believe that, that students thrive when families are involved. So there's an educational triangle, parents, teachers, students. When those three parts are working in, in partnership, that's where students do the best. So I don't think it's wise to uh, exclude parents from important conversations about what's going on in school. You know, we do have kids that are maybe afraid to tell their parents about something. Um, you know, there are ways that you can work with a family or work with a child to help them maybe feel you know, feel empowered to be able to share that. Maybe they want someone sitting with them when it happens. But, you know, the, this law, AB 1955, where um, teachers are not required to tell if a child is transitioning at school and they're, you know, that's being done. Um, that, that law is probably unconstitutional and it is going to be um, challenged in court. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Constantine, do you need me to repeat that? No, no. So, so the, the, the way the world of communication has changed dramatically. Schools, traditionally, schools like a lot of different organizations are usually the last ones to kind of get caught up. Remember when uh, we all went on the pandemic and the schools had to quickly learn how to do Zoom meetings. People like myself and a lot of other business professionals, we've been doing Zoom and WebEx for years. So it was really natural. It was a benefit in my home when my wife had to start teaching classes via Zoom, that I was a techie and understood how this all worked and was able to support her and our daughter who was going through her junior and senior year to make sure that they could uh, they could communicate properly with their teacher and then being able to guide them. We need to invest in uh, the ways that people are communicating today. We need to change how we communicate and interact with, with parents. We need to, to, to get to them. Uh, there are many parents, and one of the biggest challenges we used to deal with when we would go in all the time for parent-teacher conferences is the teacher telling my family, why are you here? Your kids are great. It's these parents who didn't show up. I'm worried about how to get in touch with them. Well, we have to change the way we interact with people. And so that, that is going to require uh, a lot of retraining, but it's also going to require uh, at the district level for us to understand how we can change. Uh, we're just now getting into some, some serious uh, new IT people um, in the district. And so we can start learning on uh, figuring out how do we communicate properly at their level. Now, talking about another level of parent involvement, like AB 1955. So, so we've, got, we've got parents who are, who are good parents, and we've got parents who are not. My wife today has homeless students because they had a powerful conversation with their parents about their identity. I am very much concerned for that child, and I'm very much concerned that we're not going to be able to, to protect them because in some families, they will throw them on the street, and we've seen it. We have students today that are like that, and so that's, that's a topic for another, uh, maybe the next question, but, but uh, there are certain parents where we, we, we have to be careful on how we communicate with them because they are abusive. Thank you. We have a, um, on that note, we do have a question from the audience. Do you believe in a one-strike policy for inappropriate sexual harassment or con conduct in teachers, staff, and children? Yes. Let's stop with that. Oh, yes. Sorry. Would you read that again? Yes. Tammy? Do you believe in a one-strike policy for inappropriate sexual harassment or conduct in teachers, staff, and children? Inappropriate sexual contact. Uh, conduct. Conduct by teachers, staff, and children. Or children, yes. As in students. Yes. Uh huh. Um, well, I definitely take those behaviors very seriously. And um, I think, you know, you know, expectations need to be set out very clearly. Uh, if, if it's a school employee, um, I would be fine with that, that level of tolerance because, um, I mean, sexual harassment, so. I don't know, some people consider a comment, um, you know, a comment can be sexually harassing, um, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, that's a little vague for me to absolutely say yes, 
But if there's any uh, physical contact involved, or um, yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to say yes, but um, I don't know. I think I would need to discuss that with my colleagues to see if there's, uh, we absolutely have to protect children. We know what's happened in our own district in um, the last couple of years, and it, it should never have happened. And um, I, yeah, I would have a very low tolerance for that. Thank you. Mr. President. Yeah, we, um, now we do have contracts with our employees and through their union, uh, and we do have to work through those avenues. But at the end of the day, just like any other business professional, if you're a teacher, and just like if in my job, if I were to sexually harass anybody, or even in the slightest bit, I lose my job. And while we have a process and stuff that we have to go through here, at the end of the day, uh, anyone who's employed should be thinking to themselves that inappropriate behavior will get you terminated, whether it takes a day or a week, it will get you fired. One way or another, there's pretty much zero tolerance in this world for that kind of behavior. Now, um, as far as student behavior, we do have disciplinary action, and we need to make sure that people are reporting inappropriate behavior. We need to make sure that children have a way to effectively report it, not through rumor, not through other forms, but they need to be able to confidently be able to find a confidant within our schools that they can discuss this with. If it isn't visible, it needs to be spoken to. Teachers are mandated reporters. If anybody is in any way sexually abused or physically abused, it goes to a teacher, they are required to report it by law. And if you don't report it by law, that teacher loses their credential. So there is pretty much already in place a world for a, a one-strike policy. However, we, um, we have different vehicles in place today by which everything has to go through a process. But for children, they need to have somebody who they can speak to confidently, and we need to make sure that we have avenues for them to, to feel safe when they wanna express th those violations happening, whether it's from a peer, or whether it's from an adult, or whether it's from somebody that they ran into in the grocery store. Somebody needs to be able to know that the teacher in that classroom can be trusted to be told these things and they will report. Thank you. Okay. American children are struggling. Reading and math scores are at their lowest in decades, while mental illnesses, absenteeism, and bullying are on the rise. School teachers say they are battling to reach students while facing their own problems of understaffing, understaffing how sal low salaries, and scarce resources. How will you address this concern, Ms. Langemold? All right, well, um, uh, fortunately, mental struggles and low low grades, if you fix one, you really are gonna be impacting the other. So uh, children basically need two things in life. They, they need, um, well, they need a safe environment, but they need to be um, in an environment where they can learn and do things and have a, develop a sense of accomplishment from that. If you ever talk to a toddler and they put a puzzle together right, you know they just light up and it's really transformative for them because they have such a strong sense of accomplishment and that is actually one of the best ways to fix, uh, to build uh, a good feeling about yourself. The other part that they need is they need to belong. They need to feel there's something bigger than themselves they need uh, to belong. And so both of those things we can provide, we're perfectly positioned in our schools to provide that to students, um, you know, um, respect for the, the other students in the classroom. Um, if we deal with these behavioral issues that we're having, we uh, will have more time for uh, instruction. And, um, you know, but this difficult behaviors at school are so disruptive and take precious time away from teachers and admin when um, we're trying to. But those two things we don't always have. We don't always have kids learning stuff and doing things and um, having a sense of belonging. From one of our audience members, do you think there should be schools to close? Oh, huh? Just yeah, oh, I'm sorry. My question. bad. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll fix it in post. Yes. Um, <laughs> we do that. Okay. American children are struggling. Reading and math scores are at the lowest in decades, while mental illnesses, absenteeism, and bullying are on the rise. School teachers say they're battling to reach students while facing their own problems of understaffing, low salaries, and scarce resources. 
How will you address these concerns? Yeah, so what's been one of the probably the greatest things that uh, uh, being part of a service group in our community is that uh, we're, we're out actively addressing the needs of, of the children. And coming out of the pandemic, uh, the kids, uh, and this is more specific to, to Kiwanis, we've, we've taken a lot of work in putting in programs like uh, the Buddy Bench, which our, our president, our past president, helps champion for us here, uh, to help kids get together, to help get rid of the loneliness, to help get rid of the isolations, the struggling, the socialization that they're missing. As a community, I think there's a lot more we as a community can do. At a school level, we need to continue to speak to our partners out there who are thinking outside of the box, like a buddy bench. Um, other organizations in our community who can help come in and, and give us uh, fresh ideas. Because uh, even within our own diverse group of board members, even with a new superintendent coming in, there's always some great ideas that come from the community that can help with kids struggling with uh, getting those social skills back. Uh, regarding the mental illness, we need to continue to make sure that we're providing providing care. And then for, for the teachers in dealing with this situation, uh, the great Her Herculean effort to help uh, fly the plane and change the engine at the same time as we're moving towards trying to get from the world we had pre-pandemic to this transition period, um, and the stress they're going through. Uh, in the wrong district, teachers are actually working what I like to call two jobs. They're looking for another job with another district, that's the other job, while also doing the job in their classroom, which is also taking away from the job in the classroom. We need to make sure that our teachers have the confidence to know that the district's behind them, it's going to take care of them, so that they can focus on the classroom without interruption of their outside life, too. And that way, when they're at school with the children, they can they can teach, they can collect information, and they can form their classroom in a way that helps move the children on. Because the whole purpose of grades like kindergarten isn't so much about ABCs and one, two, threes. It's about socialization. And we're now having to move that through the other grades. And so we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're supporting teachers in being able to address those primary skills that many kids have missed out on because of the pandemic. Thank you. Do you think there should be schools to close? If so, which ones? The ones with low attendance? So this is a very hot topic out there and it kind of breaks my heart. Um, talking, John Glenn is often mentioned. I hate the idea of that school being closed. I would rather fix the enrollment problem. I wish we hadn't waited so long. Um, there's some great things there. There are some great teachers there. and. Um, you know, that's why I think we immediately need to understand where these out-of-district transfers are, are heading for. Um, obviously, um, you know, at some point, not only are we looking at school closures, but we won't even have the funds to continue in the good programs that we're offering right now. So it is important to uh, be keeping an eye, an eye on the money, and um, I would much rather put the effort into um, seeing what we can do, maybe setting a time limit and, and trying to uh, reverse our enrollment decline uh, before, we, before we start doing that. Elementary schools are the heartbeat of neighborhoods. A lot of people move to La Mirada so their child could go to school at, the, at this school that's near the home that they purchased. And I, I totally understand that. And um, I, I think as a leader, I would want to at least, I, I feel like I would owe it to the community to, to actually be very intentional about reversing this hemorrhage um, before we start closing schools. I, I know that's um, going to be a financial strain, and I think that's where we have to set a time limit on it, and we have to also spend some of those reserves that we have. Thank you. <laughs> when we moved here, uh, we lived in a house next to an abandoned school, a closed school, a place where kids would go off and hop the fence and cause all kinds of trouble. And every so often you'd hear a kid scream because they broke an arm over there. Closed schools are a way of bringing down your property value. Closed schools are a way of increasing the likelihood of juvenile delinquency and other crimes in your neighborhood. Closed schools are properties that aren't being actively monitored. Closed schools are a problem. And we can't continue as residents to let schools close we have to rethink the formula. So one of the biggest things we need to do 
and, and, and it's, it's really obvious because we can't close John Glenn. You can't take the students at John Glenn and drop them into La Mirada High in Norwalk. La Mirada today, as my kids described it, it's like walking through Midtown Manhattan at lunch. And we can't take more kids. Already I have parents complaining to me when we close down Los Coyotes and many of those kids ended up at Benton, the traffic is astronomical. There are residents in that neighborhood who are worried about emergency services being able to get in there during school drop-off or when school's being picked up. They're absolutely scared of it. We can't afford, from a safety perspective, to actually close more schools. We have to rethink the formula. We've got to bring kids back. We've got to put money back in. As long as we're on a per-student revenue model, we need to rethink La Mirada High is a STEM STEAM academy. We need, we need to have battle bots. We need to have engineering programs. We need to have the, all the cool stuff that my cousin's kids had down in Escondido. We need to have an IV program. John Glenn is right down the street from Whitney High. There is no reason we can't make John Glenn rethought as an open enrollment IV honors academy so kids don't have to test it. Go ahead and tell the parents over it who didn't get into Whitney. Come on over to John Glenn. We'll give you all the international baccalaureate classes you want, and you don't have to test in. You want to drive on people that way? Give them an honors academy. Give them a reason to come here. And so if we can reverse those trends and we put uh, expand the culinary programs at, at, at Norwalk High, add more with VAPA over there, we can do the same things they're doing in Long Beach. They have specialized high schools for kids who are on special career paths. We do a very good job at the elementary and middle school level of guiding children down a path. And it's really exceptional, and we lose them at the eighth grade. And the easiest way to keep us from closing schools at any level is to give parents and families a reason to come back and do a better job of marketing it, because I sure as heck get a lot of flyers in the mail from ABC and Buena Park and other districts, and I know we're not doing it. So we need to be a little more communicative about what we do great here. And we also need to rethink what we're not doing and put it in right away. It's not rocket science. It's pretty quick to do. And I'm sure a new superintendent will figure out right away. Sorry. That's OK. Thank you. Um, Mr. Constantine, since you got to open first, we'll let Ms. Lincoln Walter with, uh, close with her statements first. OK, great. Um, all right. So in closing, I know we have short-term and long-term challenges. And the three I, I thought of I wanted to talk about were enrollment decline, behavioral issues on campus, and our low proficiency uh, percentages that we're reading in our school report cards. Um, we do need a data-driven approach. Um, one, one factor that causes, uh, causes a loss of students is parental dissatisfaction. Um, we, I, I shared this story with you about reviewing the content of a social studies book with Superintendent Lopez, and on the spot, he, he agreed that it was, had an ideological um, uh, approach on this textbook, this book that was being used as a required textbook as being inappropriate. And uh, he agreed right there. Um, so students also leave our, our uh, district for programs that we don't offer. At La, Mar at La Mirada High School, for example, we have nine great pathways there. Uh, but we need a few more vocational programs for those kids that want that need to start working right out of high school. Um, I know Cerritos has an EMT program. You can take the test and get certified the day after you graduate. And you know, as an 18-year-old making making EMT wages, it's it's pretty pretty satisfying. And so many of the trades have um, paid apprenticeships. And we can partner with our community colleges and the programs that exist. We we're not reinventing the wheel, so that there's a pathway for these kids. As far as behavioral issues on campus, um, wow, I hear stories now that my kids never had to deal with, and certainly um, nothing like that when my husband graduated La Mirada High. It makes it unsafe for some of our students to see fights breaking out, or when they get um, bullied on campus, then they feel like they don't want to go back to school um, because of that experience. So how um, kids, especially kids that are at risk, we really need to, uh, to have the personnel and the strategy to interact with these kids to, to um, an intervention, if you will. Um, because we, we know what kids need. We know why they act out. Um, and it's, again, to use that term, it's not rocket science. And, um, you know, we're kind of at a disadvantage at La Mirada because a lot of students that have behavioral problems, they put them there. Okay, I, I think you're giving me the time. Five, five, five seconds. Oh, okay. Okay, um, last thing, low proficiency. You know, 62% of our 
the La Mirada High students are under grade level in language arts, 31% in math and 38% in science. Those are the ones that are at grade level. We got to get our graduates have a basic educational competency when they graduate. They need to be able to know how to write and read. We got to restore the 2.0 GPA and make sure they're learning what they went to school to learn. Thank you. Thank you. I can't do this alone. I appreciate your help. And one of those ways you can help is to vote for me if you're in our district. Thank you. Okay. So, in the 15 years I've lived in La Mirada, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm blessed. My wife and I met in college. She chose to become a teacher, and I've had that experience of watching her go through and becoming credentialed. Uh, multi-subject in math, and I know the pathway and the, what comes home uh, for many of our teachers. Um, as a parent, I also know that same experience and all the work I've had to do in fighting to make sure the programs stay, the parents stop getting charged for things that we shouldn't be paying for. Um, I've been involved, again, elected or part of the PTA board at the Pluma, elected the school site council at, uh, at Benton Middle School. I was the key club advisor um, for La Mirada High School. I've served on the Kiwanis Club being present, uh, president, and now on my second stint as vice president, which is the president of my group. So my involvement in the community is um, has been nothing but, from a family perspective, about children and my children and my children's friends, and within Kiwanis, the entire community. Uh, when we look at things that keep me up at night when it comes to our schools, there are people who are having conversations about a lot of other things, and my wife had active shooter training the other day. I never thought when we were in college, and she said, I'm going to be a teacher, that we would be talking about her requiring active shooter training. We need to make sure that we have safe campuses. We need to make sure that we have places where when you drop off your children in the morning, you're not buzzing on the internet worried about what's happening during the day. So. We need to make sure that we have places that are safe, that even if you can't get in touch with your child, you know that they're okay. So that's of the biggest, most paramount thing when it comes to our community. The other things are things like, we've got a lot of data, we need better IT systems, we, uh, we don't need to be caught up in like LA County's uh, uh, ransomware attacks, we don't need to have our school system shut down, things like that. We need to make sure that we're continuing to invest in our schools, we need to make sure that we're bringing people back into these campuses. We, we need people who care, who have cared, who have got dirt in their fingernails to make this, you know, to make the school offer what it needs to offer for our kids. I've done that. I've been the dad who was out there fighting for so many programs and fighting to make sure that we weren't getting charged $15,000 a year for the pool and fighting people on the school board and the city to make sure that went away fighting to make sure honors biology didn't get dropped for freshmen. We would have lost all 30 of those kids if they would have dropped that class. They would have all been at snore in a heartbeat. The brightest minds in that class would have left this district. We can't have that mentality where we're just gonna sort of wait and let things happen. We need people who are gonna be active and involved. I'm a dad, I'm a husband. I love the fact that my wife is a teacher. I think we envisioned it that she would actually be teaching in a school that our kids would be at, but I mean, life is what it is. And it's, it's one of those unique perspectives that I bring to the board, not just as a business entrepreneur, someone who's, who's, who understands that, that kids can graduate with tech certificates and, and, and go on to various careers, and that we need to encourage that and partner with Cerritos better, with Cerritos College. But, but a, a dad who understands that who we are as adults are shaped by the experiences we have as, have as children. And I, I want to make sure our children have great experiences. So when they're adults like us, they can look back on their childhood with amazing stories and what it made them become. And so I appreciate your vote to make that happen. Thank you. This concludes our, um, our little debate that we're having. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And I think the candidates for being here and giving us some really great answers. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Love Our Blog for coming and filming this for us. Thank you very much, Tony. And for the staff for getting everything ready for us. So please feel free to stay and uh, chit chat with the candidates and ask more questions. Thank you very much.